welcome to State Lobbying Heroes Podcast, a podcast where we delve into the careers and personal life stories of some of the best and the brightest state government relations experts. I'm your host, Deepak, CEO of Legistracker. Born in Concord, North Carolina, Tom Fetzer was always into sports. The reason? His father was a football coach and his mother coached girls tennis. Tom lived in Chapel Hill until six years old and then moved to Raleigh. As a youngster, he loved to read and write. English, history and civics were his favorite topics. During high school, he was always intrigued by politics and Winston Churchill was his favorite political figure. He chose Wake Forest to major in politics. Tom graduated in 1978 right when Reagan was running for president. He was inspired to make a difference and so went to Washington for a year to work on campaigns. When Tom came back to rally, he ran for Congress but lost. That did not deter Tom. He went on to work for different administrations, gained experience in policy, and then became the mayor of Raleigh in 1993 when he was just 38 years old. Join me in learning the wisdom, experiences, and personal life story of Tom Fetzer in this next episode. Hi, Tom. Thank you so much for being on this podcast. I really do appreciate your time. I am glad to be here with you. See you. All right. So let's turn back the clock and let's start from the very beginning. Where were you born? And tell us a little bit about your childhood. Well, I was born in Concord, North Carolina, in Cabarrus County. My father was a college football coach, and he was between jobs. He had just finished up at Davidson College and was headed to the University of North Carolina. And he was an uh, assistant football coach at the University of North Carolina in the 55, 56 years after I came along. And so I was living in Chapel Hill, and uh, the whole staff got fired after the football season, I think, when I was about a year and a half old, for the usual reason of not winning enough football games. And my mother said, okay, big boy, it's time for you to get a real job. So he went to dental school at Carolina. So we lived in Chapel Hill till I was about six. And then we moved to Raleigh, where he started a, a dental practice in North Raleigh, which was nothing back in those days. And I lived pretty much my whole life in Raleigh until I was in my mid fifties. So from six to 55, almost half century, I lived in Raleigh. Awesome. And what kind of childhood did you have? Did you like, were you a lot into studies or were you not academically inclined or, but you were interested in something else? Well, it's interesting you should say, I, I was very interested in some things and not as much in others. I love to read. So English and history, civics, were very good subjects for me. I did not like math and science. I don't know whether that's left brain or right brain, but whatever it is, that's what I was. <laughs> and my dad played college football and coached, and my mother was a phys ed major and coached girls tennis and boys golf. So I was always into sports, played a lot of sports through high school, football, basketball, baseball, track. So um, pretty, a pretty well-rounded life. And just to accentuate the intellectual dichotomy in my life, when I went to Wake Forest as a freshman, and they assigned me to a physics professor to be my to do my freshman orientation advisor, and so I walked into uh, his office first day at Wake Forest, and he had actually gone to school with my dad at Wake Forest. So we exchanged a few pleasantries, and he asked about my dad, and he said, "Mr. Fetzer, I've got your incoming freshman profile here, and it's." It's unlike any incoming freshman I've ever seen. He said, you have placed out of freshman English and into remedial math. (laughs) That's sort of my um, academic priorities there. I love to read, love to write, love to speak, but don't give me a word problem or a chemistry formula. Okay, got it. So after like high school, you, why did you choose Wake Forest University? Or like, yeah, go ahead. So I I went to Wake Forest in the fall of 73, majored in politics, graduated in 78, and immediately went to work in politics, working in campaigns, ended up going to Washington for a year or so when I was young, in the first year of the Reagan administration, actually. When I was still pretty young, at 32, I ran for Congress against our current congressman, David Price, and got soundly thrashed. And then I worked in Governor Martin's administration in transportation and environment, health, and natural resources. And then in 93, 
I ran for mayor of Raleigh and was elected as the first Republican in the 200 year history of the city. So, and I was 38 when I got elected. So, Smeet York and I are the youngest people to ever serve as mayor of Raleigh. I think he was 38 the year he was elected too. So, it's great being mayor of your hometown. By the way, that's a that's a real that's a real kick. Yeah, I think I'm going to delve that more once we get to that point. So how did you choose BA politics to begin with in Wake Forest University? I mean, is there anything which like you felt like, okay, I want to get into politics? Is there was a specific reason or was it just like a choice? I think I'd always been intrigued by politics. Some of my favorite political leaders, I guess my favorite is Winston Churchill, big fan of his. And then roughly about the time that I graduated from college, Reagan was uh, mounting a campaign for president. And so like a lot of young people liked him and got involved in politics because of him, ended up going to Washington the first year he was president. He was sort of a defining political figure for people in my generation. So I think that uh, that's probably it. And I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a limited government conservative Republican. And so he he spoke to a lot of us who shared those values and govern that way. And so it was kind of an exciting time to be 25 and in Washington and thinking you're making a difference. So that's what kind of got me started. Okay. So after Wake Forest University, what was your first stint? You said you got, uh, it says you're an assistant secretary of natural resources. Was that your first stint? Well, no, that was, so I worked in campaigns for a while, went to work with uh, Senator John East in Washington right after he got elected in 1980, spent a year in Washington, came back. So you got, you moved to Washington for about a year? For just a year. Yeah, I was 25 years old. Came back to Raleigh in the mid-80s, worked in the Reagan, Reagan's campaign, re-election campaign in 84, was, was actually, went to my first national convention in 1984 in Dallas. And then I ended up running for Congress in 88 and lost. And then I worked in Governor Mard's administration. That's when I was the Assistant Secretary of uh, Environment, Health, and Natural Resources. And then later, a Deputy Secretary at the Department of Transportation. And that got that gave me some, um, some real hands-on experience with policy and execution, executive branch experience, which was really good. And Jim Martin was a, a great guy, a wonderful governor, a chemist. Uh, a professor of chemistry at Davidson before he went into politics. Very smart guy, very good leader, and provided me some real good life lessons and examples about how to lead, which I think helped me later. Okay. So, yes, I think if if you had to put now like a, a microscope and look at that specific time period after you graduated and you did your first couple of years of foray into politics, what kind of skills did you think you gathered, which you acquired, which are kind of helpful for you right now? Politics is a people bit. And so if you don't like people, it, it's probably not a good place. I also learned not to take political differences personally. I, I've always been a firm believer in, in civilized uh, debate. I have many friends who believe differently from me for that reason, but I respect their opinions and, and their passion. And I think that one of the problems in our country is not enough people really care about policy. They care about how things impact them, but they don't look at the larger picture and think about their country and what's best for their country and, and those type of things. So I really appreciate people who see the big picture and think about things other than just how it impacts them personally and take the time to develop reasoned opinions and knowledgeable opinions and fact-based opinions and then have the ability to articulate about those. So those are things that I picked up, the ability to fight a belief system, to adopt values, and then be able to relate those values clearly and, and concisely so that people can understand them. That has, um, that has carried me a long way, I think. So if someone was listening to this and let's say if they, if they are just getting into the universities to get a degree or if they're graduating and they're debating as to, you know, how they want to get into lobbying. So what would you suggest would be they should do as the first step to actually get their hands or feet wet? Well, I talk to a lot of young people about their education and what they should focus on. And I tell them, if you leave college and you can write well and you can speak well, 
you can do anything. I, I think one of the biggest failures of American higher education right now is we're graduating too many people who don't write well, don't speak well. And that is, um, that's a problem. Uh, I also tell young people, study what you love because you're going to spend a lot of time on it, but spend some time learning finance. Uh, a lot of, you will save yourself a lot of money understanding the, the basic nuances of, of personal finance. And so uh, that's the advice I give to young people. I tend to like to hire people who are well-written and well-spoken because those are the skill sets that I need in my business. Okay. So, so let's see if we go back into your career. So after you were the chief deputy secretary of DOT, right? Or let's let's get into that. So what, what kind of tasks were you doing while you were the chief deputy secretary of DOT? Well, I was responsible for 15,000 employees and about a billion and a half dollar budget. It was building roads and finding and the biggest the biggest challenge in transportation is to determine priorities. Uh, lots of roads need to be built. Which are the ones that are most important? Which are the ones that will best serve the public? Which are the ones that will most improve the lives of the people in the state and the people traveling through it? And those are tough decisions to make. Thankfully, we had good budget years in those years. So the gas tax was performing well. We didn't have budget constraints. So it was a good time to be in that business. And, and North Carolina made a lot of progress in those years. And Governor Martin got the legislature to pass a highway trust fund that still exists to this day that dedicates a certain amount of money every year to building new roads and maintaining existing roads. And it's, it's really important. So learning how to manage big budgets and lots of people, how to delegate things, how to hold people accountable, how to track progress, and not to confuse motion with progress. That's that's a really important thing. A lot of people they think prog they think progress is doing stuff. You can be running and staying in place and not getting anywhere. So it's really important to understand what your goal is and are you progressing towards it? And is it tangible and is it accountable and is it measurable? And so those are some important lessons I learned at that at that station. So after you had that work, you then were you like running for like the House of Representatives or did you get elected there? No, I, uh, I Congress in 1988 and then went to work in the Martin administration in 1989 and worked there for the last three years of his administration. And then so he left office in January of 93. And then I ran in October of 93 and got elected mayor of Raleigh. So that was a uh, that was the transition there. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about like what kind of work were you doing when you were the House of Representatives? Well, I, I didn't get elected. I, I just uh, I ran for the office in 1988, which was the year that George Bush was elected president. And David Price had been elected to the seat in 86, having defeated uh, Bill Kobe, who's one of my mentors. And so he was a, he was a first term representative when I ran against him. And of course, he's been there ever since, except for one two year hiatus when Fred Heineman beat him in the 94 sort of Republican landslide. So, um, you know, in retrospect, it's better that I didn't get elected to Congress. I, I don't think I would have enjoyed Washington. I think the pace is too slow up there for me. I much preferred local government where you can just identify problems and create solutions and implement those solutions pretty quickly. Whereas in Washington, it just it takes forever, it seems, to get anything done. So uh, looking back on it, I have no regrets about losing that campaign and you don't really you don't really understand politics until you've lost a campaign so that was a good learning experience for me losing my first one i didn't lose any more after that but uh, it was a good experience okay so what made you come back and and fight for being a mayor of rally i mean and how can you talk us through that process how did you win that uh, election and all of that yes well raleigh's my hometown and taxes were going up. There had been, I think, nine tax increases in the 10 years before I got elected. Crime was up. And city elections weren't talking, and, and city council candidates weren't talking about crime and taxes. They were talking about a shopping center here or a zoning there. And it was all about growth issues. And, and the bigger picture, things were getting lost. We had more employees in parks and recreation than we did in the police department. 
and crime was getting out of hand. So I ran on issues that I thought would get a bigger turnout. And we, I think we had a record turnout the year that I ran because we talked about taxes and we talked about crime and we talked about what we were going to do about it. And I also realized that I was not going to get elected without doing better than most Republicans normally do in the African-American community. So I really focused efforts there. I went, I went door to door in African-American neighborhoods. I got some of the guys that I played high school football with to take me through their neighborhoods. And the African-American community had really been ignored. Democrats just assumed that they were going to get African-American votes and Republicans assumed they weren't. So nobody went and asked. And so one of the things I told people when I showed up at their front door and they were really aghast to see a white Republican on their front porch I said, just remember when you go to vote, who cared enough to come to your front door and ask you for your vote? And I got a, I got a very good, solid amount of support from the African-American community in Raleigh when I got elected the first time and in, the, in my second, third races as well. So uh, we put together um, an interesting coalition. And, and what I found actually is that culturally and ideologically, African-American voters are very conservative. They're church-oriented. Uh, they're family-oriented. They're work-oriented. But I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't gone and had conversations with literally thousands of them. So uh, it was a great revelation for me, and it, it very much helped me govern the city because I understood that there was a lot more basic things, basic values, uniting people than there were dividing them. And that really helped uh, to understand and, and know that. So your being a mayor for the first term, that's for like how many years? Is it two or three? Two year terms. Okay. And can you talk about any challenging projects you did for the first term? Anything which you can distinctly remember? Yes. I, I mentioned that taxes have been going up rather routinely, nine times in 10 years. So we reduced taxes each of the first two years I was mayor. We also hired a lot of new police officers and we opened up some new parks and built some more roads. And we showed people that if you budget and prioritize and spend the money where it's most important and look for ways to save, you can not only reduce people's tax burden, but also improve their services. And, and, and we proved that. And we, and we reduced the crime rate in Raleigh uh, significantly. And the other thing that was a real problem is that people didn't feel that government was working for them. So particularly people in the development business, uh, building, they've got mired down and permits and inspections and it was costing them a lot of money because the, the, the clock was running and the city government didn't seem to understand that when you delayed somebody you, you were costing them money. So we streamlined our approval process for permits and all that sort of thing and we actually even borrowed a an innovation from other cities that we call night court where developers and builders could come in in the evening and we'd get our whole staff in one room and they could get their permits issued in one night. And they had to pay a little extra because we had paid people overtime. But it was, a, it was an innovation that was very popular in the city because it just kind of declogged, just kind of a gridlocked system. And it was very frustrating for people trying to get things done. And, and after your first term, then for the second term, can you talk us through like, you know, how, how challenging was it for, to get reelected and what was the highlights of the second term? Well, I sort of brought uh, modern political campaigning uh, to the mayor's race in Raleigh. Prior to my election in 93, I don't think anybody had ever spent more than $50,000 on a mayor's race. And I spent a half a million. And we did television advertising. And we did mail. And we did vote turnout. And we did all that stuff. And so part of my success was I was very disciplined about raising money. Uh, and so that you could get a message out to people. And so that really helped me. Uh, the first term, the first election, I won by about 980 votes out of 50,000 cast. Second term, I won about 60% of the vote. And third term, I won about just under 60% of the vote. So part of which was, I think people in Raleigh liked what was going on. Their taxes were getting lower, their city was getting safer, and we were still investing in our community. Uh, and part of it was uh, we ran well-funded and sophisticated message-oriented campaigns uh, that worked based on survey research and sound, sound 
campaign decisions. So um, after the first election, my second and third were relatively easy. And uh, during the second and third term, can you think of anything which any projects or anything which was challenging or anything which you felt like you were very proud of? Well, the city had been struggling with a home for the fine arts community. And there'd been lots of plans and nobody had any money and it was all very expensive. And we, we came up with a plan to expand Memorial Auditorium, which President Truman had laid the cornerstone for, uh, I think, in the 1940s. So we uh, we added on to that building and built a um, the finest symphony hall, I think, between Washington, D.C. and South Florida and an opera hall and a great big theater. And that project will will pay dividends for 100 years or more. So very proud of that. We built the first two, two new fire stations in a, about 20 years in Raleigh, finished a lot of highway improvements, kept adding to our police force and, and reduced crime. And again, we I think we lowered the tax rate. When I first became mayor, it was 67 cents per $100 valuation. And when I left, it was in the 30s. So we reduced the tax rate and burden on on the public um, greatly while still investing in improvements in parks and transportation and crime fighting. And if you look back now and looked at the entire career of being a, a mayor, can you tell us like what was the one skill you acquired during that entire term? You would have acquired a lot, but what was the one major thing which you would have acquired? Leadership I've found is a learning process. And the only way to learn is to listen. And I, I actually I had a kind of a leadership matrix, and it, it started with listening, and then learning, and then helping. So if you listen to people, you can learn enough to help them, and once you've helped them, then you you've earned the right to lead them. And so I tried to I tried to make listening, and learning the cornerstone of leadership, and that um, that proved very helpful to me. I learned a lot, learned a lot of things I didn't know, learned a lot of things that led me to believe that things I had thought were so actually weren't. Mark Twain once famously said, it's not the things you don't know that hurt you, it's the things you're absolutely certain of that ain't so. And so uh, if you if you devote yourself to listening and learning, you will um, you'll figure out a lot of stuff. So say so now that you are a mayor, how do you see, I mean, right now, how does the city of Raleigh, I mean, do you feel it's going in the right direction, or do you feel like some changes are needed? Well, I don't live any, in Raleigh anymore. Shortly after I got married in 2009, my wife and I moved to Wilmington, where we live and where we have had five children. And so I don't follow Raleigh politics much as closely as I used to, and therefore I, I don't really I don't really offer opinions because they're not they're not well founded. So I still love my hometown, but uh, I'm not I'm not as connected there politically as I once was. Okay, I understand. And do you like Wilmington? And and do you like Wilmington? Love Wilmington. You know, Wilmington is an old city. Around the turn of the 20th century, it was the largest city in North Carolina. It's a very historic city, uh, one of the oldest cities in the South, uh, a port city. So a lot of historical importance there. And uh, it's still relatively small. I think Wilmington's around 100,000 people, but it's a very eclectic community. People from all over the country live here because they like the coast and they like the quality of life here and it's a great place to raise children and the good thing is that if i need to be in raleigh i can be there in about an hour and 45 minutes so uh not bad i agree so after being a mayor you were a fellow in harvard university so how did that happen and what was it all about yes um, harvard university has uh, something that was uh, started i think to honor late president john f kennedy who was a harvard grad called the institute of politics and they routinely take retiring politicians who are finished with their terms and bring them to Harvard to teach students at the Institute of Politics about things based on their experiences. And I had a reputation, I think, for being an, uh, an innovative young mayor who had done some interesting things. And so uh, Alan Simpson, uh, the former Republican senator uh, from Wyoming, was the director of the Institute at that time. And um, he invited me to come and, and teach there for a semester, which I did. A great experience. Boston is a great city. I really enjoyed being in Boston, really enjoyed the intellectual energy that's at Harvard. It was a great experience and met some great people. Had lunch with John Kenneth Galbraith, the, the famed Harvard economics professor. 
and advisor to presidents going back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So met some really, really interesting people. And and did you like teaching? I do. I, I, I very much enjoy teaching. Teachers that I had have had a lifelong lasting impact on my life. Curtis Booker, who was my taught me American literature when I was in high school, forced me to endure Moby Dick and the Scarlet Letter and Hemingway and Faulkner and it was just a life changing experience. And I still call him every now and then and recite to him things he made me memorize in the 1970s. So I, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy the look on young people's faces when they learn something they didn't know. And they, you can see that they have sort of a revelation. I, I think that's a real powerful moment. And I very much enjoy those times. And my wife and I are homeschooling our kids now. So I'm still doing doing some teaching, uh, not math, <laughs> but she lets me teach history and English. So uh, those are my strong suits. Oh, that's nice. So after you were the fellow in, you so how long were you there in Boston before you became the chairman of the Republican Party? Well, I went to, I went to Boston in 2000. And at the end of that semester, I got offered a job uh, at the United States Tennis Association to be a chief executive up there. Interesting story about how all that happened. So when I was mayor, we brought the Champions Tennis Tour to Raleigh, which was the, the old legends, Jimmy Connors, John McEnroe, Bjorn Borg, Yannick Noah, Mats Wielander, people like that. And Pete Lofton, who's now deceased, who founded uh, BTI, was the, was the sponsor. It was the BTI Champions Tournament. And we had three great years in Raleigh, 97, 98, and 99. And in the spring of 99, the U.S. Fed Cup team, which is the, the women's equivalent of the Davis Cup, was supposed to play a match in Croatia, spring of 99. And the USTA is such a singularly insular organization, they really weren't paying attention to what was going on in Croatia during that time. And Croatia was coming apart at the seams. So about two weeks before the match was to be played, uh, Billie Jean King, who was the Fed Cup captain, and Carol Gravener decided, you know, we can't send American women to Croatia right now. So they, um, Billie Jean King and Carol Graber decided they couldn't send American women to Croatia, and they were looking for an American city to host the Fed Cup tie with Croatia on two weeks' notice. And we were in the process of selling tickets, had the stadium built for the, for the Champions Tour, and so we said, okay, we'll do it. So Fed Cup had never sold out on American soil. We sold the tickets out in four days. Uh, we got the Meredith College Chorale to learn the Croat National Anthem in Croat, so we had this very riveting opening ceremony where the Croatians, you could see tears welling in their eyes because they heard their national anthem sung in their own tongue. And anyway, it was just a great success. And the USDA was so thrilled that about a year later, it developed into a job opportunity for me at the United States Tennis Association in New York. So I went there and spent four years in, uh, in White Plains, New York, working at the United States Tennis Association. Uh, which was a, a great experience and uh, one that I cherish. And I still try to go to the U.S. Open, not every year, but maybe every other year. And it's beginning to look more and more like maybe there won't be a U.S. Open this year. You know, we'll see. Yes, I agree. So do you get like free tickets or anything like that? Oh, no, I don't get free tickets. Uh, <laughs> occasionally, I can wrangle an invitation to the president's box, but uh, I have to buy my tickets and, uh, and they're expensive, but it's worth it. And the U.S. Open is one of the great sporting events in the world and other than the olympics it is the most heavily attended sporting event uh, annual sporting event in the world almost a million people come to the u.s open every year over two weeks so it's just a great it's a great spectacle and great sport and the people who play tennis are great people i agree i agree yeah i used to love tennis and soccer and cricket those are the three sports i i used to absolutely enjoy watching them on tv and when I was in India, when I was like a young boy and kid, so they used to show U.S. Open, you know, with Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi and all of those guys. And I, I, I used to absolutely love the hairstyles of Andre Agassi, actually. <laughs> well, his hairstyles have changed pretty dramatically over the years. He used to have shoulder length hair. And by the time his career finished, he was he had a shaved head. I know. <laughs> but, but Agassi was a, a great player and a great human being and doing great things in Las Vegas, his hometown with the uh, Andre Agassi College Preparatory Academy and doing great things for young people in his hometown. 
Oh, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. So after the tennis association, what was your next stint? Uh, well, I came back to Raleigh and started a consulting business. We did some political consulting, did some public relations, things like that. And then... Yeah, I'll, I'll let you pause there. Sorry to interrupt you. So, how, so why did you make that move? I missed home. As I like to say, the United States Tennis Association is, is more political than politics and more dysfunctional than government. And I just got tired of it. And so I decided to come home and start a company with a partner, uh, Mark Stevens, who's since passed away. And then in 2009, I was approached about being state party chairman, which I initially rejected out of hand, but came around. The absolute worst political fight I've ever been in in my life was running for state party chairman in 2009. And there were several times during that um, few months when I was involved in that campaign that I just wanted to walk away from it. It was so grueling and uncomfortable and aggravating, but persevered and became state party chairman and really focused on fundraising, um, building the party. I felt like the 2010 election would be a great opportunity for us as it would be, it was going to be President Obama's first midterm election, having been elected in 2008. Midterm elections are usually pretty pretty bad for the party that controls the White House. And so I thought 2010 would be a really good opportunity. And so we worked really hard and I predicted it would happen and it happened. The Republicans won majorities in the state house and state Senate, uh, both for the first time since I think 1874. No state in the country had gone longer without Republican majorities in both the House and Senate chambers than North Carolina. So it was sort of a historic outcome. I also got married during the time I was state party chairman. So it was a very uh, eventful, if not tumultuous uh, time for me personally, but also very gratifying and satisfying. And it, um, it propelled me into the career uh, that I enjoy today. I became a lobbyist after uh, serving as state party chairman. Uh, so I've been doing that for 11 years now and didn't know whether I would enjoy lobbying or not, but I do enjoy it immensely. Uh, I have great clients who are great friends, and it is a career that has afforded me the opportunity to spend a lot of time with my children because the legislature is not in session year round. It's eight months one year and three months the next. Now, there's a lot going on when they're not in session, so it's not like I'm just sitting here with my feet up, but it, it does uh, provide me an opportunity to uh, set my own schedule and, and spend a lot of time with my kids. Yes, I understand. So can you tell us like one thing which I forgot to ask is, so during your tennis association and being the chairman of Republican Party, can you tell us like what skills you probably acquired during those stints? which probably is helping you in your career now? Well, uh, I think just persistence. As I previously alluded to, the, um, the tennis gig was uh, frustrating for me in that I could see changes that needed to occur in the United States Tennis Association, but was unable to build a consensus around those changes. So in many ways, it you know, wasn't able to succeed in what I had hoped to do, but out of that uh, failure, if that's what you want to call it, what I learned that helped me years later as state party chairman is that you just have to overcome obstacles. And if people don't want to change, you either have to persuade them or run over them. And sometimes it just it just has to come to that. And so that experience at the USTA toughened me up some. And I learned that change is difficult to bring about. It's not easy. A lot of people resist it just because they don't understand it and because they're uncertain about what change is going to do to them. And so you have to you have to convince people to lay aside their anxieties and accept that change is coming and to prepare for it in a positive manner. And for those people who don't want to do that, you just have to get them out of the way and, and get down the road with it. And so uh, that's what I learned as state party chairman. Develop a vision and a strategy to get you there and then implement it and get people to buy it if you can. And if they don't, just do it anyway. So now in your current position as a lobbyist with Tom Fetzer, as, as Fetzer Strategic, can you tell us through, walk us through what kind of projects are you working on and what kind of clients or what kind of verticals do you work with? Well, the interesting thing about it, it changes every day. So the projects you're working on one week can be completely different the next week. And a lot of it is based on what your clients need. 
There are some misconceptions about lobbying. It's really not about persuasion. Politicians are smart people. Uh, they know when they're trying to be when you're trying to sell them something. And uh, I don't try to do that because I don't think it works. What I try to do is give them information and educate them in a way where they can make informed decisions. Lobbying is not unlike almost everything else in the world. It's about relationships. And relationships are always based on one thing, generally, and that's tr trust. And the way you earn trust with these, with these political leaders is you tell them the truth. And you give them all the information, both beneficial and harmful to your cause, because you don't want them to get blindsided. So when I go in to talk to a legislator, I generally don't say, I need you to do this. I say, I represent so-and-so. And here's some information that they want you to know, because you're going to have to make a decision this week, next week, two weeks from now. And they want to make sure that you have all the information that you need to make a good decision. Now, the other side is going to say this. And this is where I think they're wrong. And this is where I think they're right. And if you, if you approach it that way and not worry so much about the outcome, but worry about the process of educating and enlightening and, and informing legislative leaders, then you generally come out to the good. You can't win everyone. And you have to take a long haul, a long, a big, big picture view of this. You may lose a few battles, but you got to stay in the game. You got to lose gracefully. You got to not take it personally because the people that you're working against one week may be your allies the next. But first and foremost, and above all, you can never do anything to damage that relationship of trust you have with the people whose office you need to get into. They have to, they have to believe when you come in that door that you're not going to bore them and you're not going to bully them, but you're going to give them in a concise, cogent presentation information that they need to know to make informed decisions. And if they believe you are going to do that, they will give you the time to, to make your presentation. And if you do it in an interesting way, and even sometimes make it humorous or interesting, uh, they will appreciate that as well. So that's the way I approach it. And it, it's worked well for me. The other very important thing about lobbying is you have to be careful who your clients are. You don't define your clients, they define you. And so you have to kind of figure out what you want to be, what kind of lobbyist you want to be, what kind of what, what's your sweet spot. And I have tried to specialize in North Carolina based uh, businesses, uh, big businesses that uh, that need representation. I've, I've been very fortunate to have some great clients to work with and to work for. And the secret to keeping clients is to make sure they know that you're doing the best that you can for them, that you're going to work hard, and that you're going to give them good advice. And, and sometimes that means says, I don't think you should do this, or I don't think you should do this this way. And and that's important. If you, if you begin with a process about doing it the right way, then that is inevitably going to lead you into some intersections where you think it may not be getting done the right way, and you have to correct your clients past them or decide to part company with them. And, and that happens occasionally. But, but generally, I, I've only lost one or two clients in the 11 years I've been working because, again, it's a relationship of trust. They know that I'm going to do my best for them, and then I'm going to give them good advice, even sometimes if it's not what they want to hear. And so that's really important. You're, you know, the only thing you have in life is your good name and your integrity. And if you lose it, it's gone. It doesn't come back. And so you have to, you have to guard it, protect it very, very jealously. That's, that's really amazing advice. So I have a few rapid fire questions for you. And okay. they're going to be pretty, pretty simple. So it's not something which you would not know. Of. So if you're all good, I'm going to get started. Okay. All right. What are the three skills you think are essential for someone to be a good lobbyist? You have to like people. You have to have unquestioned integrity. And you have to have an interesting an informative way to disseminate information. Well said. What would you be if you weren't a lobbyist? I would love to be a high school football coach. We didn't even get into football. So wait, I mean, why why are you interested in that? I, I grew up, my, my dad was a football coach. I grew up playing it. it, it it's a great sport. It, it teaches teamwork. You go through a lot together. It builds relationships that last forever. It's about hard work. It's about personal sacrifice. It's about sacrificing for the team it's about physical exertion it's about working through pain just a lot of great lessons that come out of it and what is your favorite book or hobby 
Well, I love to read. My favorite book is probably William Manchester's The Last Lion Alone, which is the second of his three-part trilogy on Winston Churchill. Great okay. book. Okay. Great book. Do you have any role models in your life? Yes. Bill Coby, who um, was the athletic director at the University of North Carolina and uh, got me into politics when he decided to run for lieutenant governor in 1980, is a role model. Our senator, uh, Richard Burr, his father, David Burr, was like a second father to me and was the longtime minister of First Presbyterian Church in Winston-Salem. He's a role model for me. And uh, why? They're both deeply spiritual men who are kind and patient but also resolute and always tell the truth. And finally, what inspires or motivates you? Well, different things inspire you at, at different times in your life. What motivates me now at the tender age of 65, I have my Medicare card to prove it, is um, to be the best man, best husband, and best father that I can be. That, that's really, really important. Um, way more important than being the best lobbyist or being the best club tennis player. And that's what, uh, that's what motiv motivates me and energizes me. And it's where I have my most uh, sincere disappointments when I feel like I'm falling short in those areas. I'm sure you'll probably, like the way the immense career you had, I'm pretty sure you'll learn how to be good at it, I'm pretty sure. But thank you so much, Tom, for being on the show. I really do appreciate it. It was truly my honor to have Tom Fetzer in this episode. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you have a wonderful day ahead. Take care until next time.